So I'm going to be talking today about uh, a disease called ocular cicatricial pentagoid, also known as mucous membrane pentagoid. Um, depending on the literature that you read, I find these are used pretty synonymously. Um, so I'll start with a case presentation. This is a 58-year-old male who presented to the VA with a chief complaint of eye redness and irritation. And basically, this has been going on for a long time, um, for many years, but it was worsening over the past year. He was also noticing some blurred vision that was getting worse o over the past year and uh, some, some skin growths that he mentioned over both eyes that were slowly enlarging. Um, and interestingly, asking about his ophthalmic history, he originally didn't rem recall really any specific history of, of procedures on his eyes or, or any specific treatments. Um, talking about his medical history, the, the main thing that he did mention was back in 97, um, he was raising sheep at home and uh, he, he was talking about some procedure he did where you, sh you have to shove a tube down the sheep's throat and I'm not sure what it was for, but he cut his finger while doing this and ended up devel developing this infection called ORF, which is a zoonotic viral infection. And reading about it, it usually resolves on its own o over a few weeks. In his case, a short time after developing this, um, kind of his whole body started to break out in these, in these uh, blisters. And he says originally they looked like chicken pox, eventually they developed into a little bit larger um, bulla. And they involved the left eye, um, um, the medial campus of the left eye. And he's th the skin sores, he remembers they were eventually treated. He doesn't remember exactly how. Um, but the, the growths in his eye never really went away. They persisted. Um, he denied, since then, he hasn't had any other skin problems. He hasn't had any other problems with, with uh, mucous membranes anywhere else. He does have a history of depression. Uh, medications he was on vitamin D, citalopram, and Ambien. Uh, his parents and brother had diabetes. He had a brother with rheumatic heart disease, um, but no other history of inflammatory or autoimmune conditions. He was a 20-pack year smoker. He raised sheep at home and had pretty recently lost his job. So on exam, he was seeing 2060 and 2070, pinhole to 2040 in both eyes. Um, his pressures were normal. Pupils were reactive. Um, his motility was, was full and visual fields were normal. On slit lamp exam, he did have mild conjunctival injection in the left eye more than the right. And you can see here, um, he did have bilateral pterygia. And in the left eye, he had this anchoring component um, binding the pterygia to the palpebral conjunctiva. Um, his anterior chamber was deep and quiet. His iris was normal. His lens was clear. He did have decreased tear film in both eyes, um, consi consistent with his complaints of some dry eye symptoms. His phonoscopic exam was normal. So this patient initially was worked up and was consented for pterygian excision. Um, when he presented on, on the day of surgery, he, he kind of remembered being in a similar situation before. His memory was kind of jogged, I guess you could say. And all of a sudden, he remembers that he's had some sort of procedure on his eye. So uh, his, he was looked up in the Moran records, and he was found to be in our system. Where back in 97, he had had a conjunctival biopsy, which was consistent with, with OCP. Um, and he had been treated for a year with cyclophosphamide. Um, and then after that, he had basically been lost to follow up, and he hadn't been seen since then. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the disease, and then I'll go back to our patient, kind of his course and management. Um, so mucous membrane pemphigoid, again, it's, it's kind of used synonymously in the literature with ocular cicatricial pemphigoid. It's a rare disease, aff affects mucous membranes, as you might guess. Um, it leads to blisters and erosions that eventually rupture and then scar and then can contract and lead to tissue damage. Um, this is a rare disease, again, 1 in 8,000 to 1 in 46,000. It's hard to know the exact incidence because it's a rare disease and it's tricky to diagnose. Um, females do tend to get it twice as often as males. Um, there's a mean age of 70. It's pretty rare, actually, to get it under 60 years old, um, and it is associated with HLA, BR4, and BP starting to bleed. Um, it's usually bilateral, but as we saw, one eye can be more extensively involved. For pathogenesis, this is a type 2 hypersensitivity, which, uh, if you recall, is direct interaction of antibodies um, against target antigens. And in this case, the target antigens include uh, BPAG2 or bolus pemphigoid antigen 2, 
and epilogrin or laminin-5. Those are the main two. Um, this is usually IgG, but can be IgA. Um, and then I, I mentioned this study here. Uh, back in 2002, there was this group that showed that if you had mice that were uh, deficient in mast cells and complement, they still would, would uh, have this blistering condition if you gave them anti-laminin-5 antibodies. So they, they said that kind of showed that this was a direct interaction of those antibodies. So this is kind of just a schematic of uh, the, the uh, basement membrane with underlying connective tissue and uh, keratinocyte, the basal keratinocytes. And you can see laminin-5 is one of these proteins that anchors the basement membrane to underlying connective tissue. And uh, this BP180, that's the same thing as BPAG2. And that kind of binds the basal keratinocyte to the basement membrane. So either of those can be targeted by these antibodies. Um, as far as uh, staging this disease on clinical presentation, I think it's important to keep in mind that staging um, is, is a useful way to be able to communicate where a patient's at with this disease, but it does not necessarily guide treatment. Um, um, there's, there hasn't been any data or studies that show that for this stage, this treatment works best. Um, but it's more dependent on how a patient's progressing over time. Um, so in stage one, it can be pretty subtle that you'll see subepithelial fibrosis. Um, and you'll see uh, redness, pain, and tearing. In stage two, the hallmark of stage two of the disease is foreshortening, or foreshortening of the fornices. And um, this can be greater from 2A to 2D, um, depending on how much the, the conjunctival fornices are shortened. Um, you can also get goblet cell loss and, and um, tear deficiency, mostly due to scarring and, and closure of lacrimal ducts. Stage three, you get symblephron formation, which is a, uh, basically a fibrous adhesion between uh, palpebral and bulbar conjunctiva. Or in our case, it was between that pterygium and the, and the palpebral conjunctiva. And stage four disease uh, is when it gets severe to the point that you start to get some ankyloblepharon or some partial fusion of the eyelids. You get frozen, you can get a frozen or fixed globe and you get pretty severe corneal damage. So here's just a picture of, of some of the foreshortening you can see. Um, on this lower lid, you can see foreshortening and quite a bit of scarring um, under the epithelium. And again, this is our patient again. You can see the symblephron, um, which is right here. And again, you might also see it if, if in a lot of other patients, you'd see it kind of just connecting conjunctiva here. Um, and ankyloblepharon, you can see a little bit of, of starting to fuse at the temporal eyelids there. And then other sites can be involved. In fact, in mucous membrane temporoid, the, the mouth, the oral mucosa is most commonly involved, and the eye is, is second common. Um, people that have ocular involvement, it's about 15 to 50 percent will also have oral involvement. But it can affect the pharynx, the esophagus, and it eventually leads to scarring and contraction of these, which um, can obviously lead to pretty severe problems. And the skin can be involved. You can, you can get vesicles or bullae that, that can hemorrhage. As far as the differential, um, there's kind of four main categories that, that your differential is going to include. Post-infectious uh, problems can, can cause a similar picture as well as some allergic, allergic uh, conditions like atopic keratosis conjunctivitis or Susan Johnson. As far as autoimmune problems, um, there's quite a few that can have a really similar picture. Um, and there's a few miscellaneous things like severe rosacea or medication-induced. There are a few glaucoma medications that can cause a similar similar picture, pilocarpine, timolol, and a few other uh, drops. Um, so to make the diagnosis, we need to use our brains. Uh, I thought this was applicable to us at the Moran Eye Center. <laughs> so really the way to, that was my mid-presentation attention getter. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed that one. So this is differ differentiated. Um, <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> so this is uh, the way to make the diagnosis is basically using the signs and symptoms I mentioned before. You, you need to pay really close attention for those. And then also with the conjunctival biopsy. And um, uh, often direct immunofluorescence and indirect immunofluorescence will be done. Um, so basically the way that you differentiate it from other autoimmune problems is um, 
this one specifically causes pretty significant scarring and some of the auto other autoimmune problems such as classic both pemphigoid, pemphigescent one ear, IgA, uh, don't cause nearly as much scarring. Um, also, pseudopemphigoid or drug-induced pemphigoid, basically the way to differentiate it from that is if you, if you think it's drug-induced, you stop the drug and see if it resolves. If it doesn't, then it's, it, there's a good chance it's this. Um, and then conjunctival biopsy. So direct immunofluorescence is going to show a linear band right along that basement membrane um, under the epithelium, and you'll see IgG, IgA, or C3. And indirect immunofluorescence can also show um, circulating autoantibodies against um, the basement membrane zone. And this is often tested on salt split uh, skin. And depending on, uh, I pointed out those antigens, but depending on where where these, these uh, autoantibodies bind on the salt split skin, you can kind of have an idea of which antigen is being targeted. So here's a picture of a, a H and E stain of a conjunctival biopsy showing um, subepithelial bulla formation. And underneath, you can see there's a scarred and inflamed substantial propria. Um, immunofluorescence. This isn't passed from our patient, but this is, this is uh, what you'd expect to see. So this, this is where you can see those linear deposits of IgG lining up along the basement membrane. Um, so treatment, the goals are to prevent further damage, basically. You want to stop further scar formation, treat dry eye, and maintain normal anatomy and eyelid and eyelash uh, position. So basically, all patients that have ocular involvement are high risk and need, need treatment and careful follow-up. And again, treatment's based on the speed of development of, of disease and the speed of scarring and not necessarily on the stage. So someone with stage four disease that you see over many years is not progressing at all will be treated differently from someone with stage one who over the course of a few weeks is getting worse. Um, so basically you treat mild disease with slow progression with dapsone. Um, again, this shouldn't be used in G6PD deficiency and can cause some hemolysis. Um, for more extensive rapid progression, prednisone is often used, as well as these immunomodulators, methotrexate, azathioprine, and mycophenolate. Um, cyclophosphamide is used for severe inflammation or uh, corneal involvement. And again, this is what our patient was originally treated with. And a lot of times when people present, they'll be, they'll be started on prednisone and cyclophosphamide just to stop the blister formation and get the disease under control. A um, couple of treatments. Uh, IVIG has been used in, a, in some small studies, but there's no long-term data showing its, its safety. And topical vitamin A has been shown in some studies as well to decrease or, or reverse keratinization, um, but it's not available as an ophthalmic scrub. Um, it's important to keep in mind with the anti epilogrin subtype, there's an increased risk for malignant tumors, so um, some screening sh should be done. Um, surgical correction can be done. Th the thing to keep in mind is it's extremely important to have the disease under very good control. Um, if not, you're going to just induce that much more inflammation. It's going to lead to that much more damage. Um, and then keratoprosthesis or carcerosis can be indicated. And communication is really important. So talking to, to our patient, he actually felt really bad that he hadn't been followed up in so many years. And he, he felt like it was not made known to him the magnitude of this condition potentially. Um, I think he was pretty fortunate to have not progressed a lot more. Um, but, but he felt like he should have been explained a little bit more about how a disease can progress and, and really the importance of good follow-up. Um, there is a lot of prognostic uncertainty. It's basically chronic and progressive with exacerbations, but patients can go a long time with remissions. So for our patient, um, looking back at his records, he had had a biopsy with direct immunofluorescence that did show intense linear deposits of IgG, IgA, and C3 along the basement membrane. And then indirect uh, immunofluorescence also did show um, an IgG basement membrane antibody that uh, adhered on the epidermal and dermal side of the split skin, so kind of binding to both of those. Um, and a weak presence of IgA adhering to, to the epithelial side. And the, the doctor that that read the path, uh, dermatologist Dr. Zone, uh, said that this is most likely representative of anti epilogrin type extracticial pemphigoid. So he was started on Dapsone and uh, set up an appointment to follow up with dermatology, and a consult was placed with immunology. He was started on FML. And a week later, he was seen again. He was tolerating the treatment well. His eye was feeling much more comfortable. 
His visual acuity in the left eye had improved to 2050. Um, so basically, this is a rare disorder with chronic scarring. Uh, uh, diagnosis is, is, is tricky, requires kind of clinical judgment as well as histological and immunopathologic uh, studies. And this is treated with steroids and immunomodulators, and the prognosis is, is widely variable. So, any questions? Dr. Machete. systemic malignancy. I couldn't find um, specific ones, but just general, I think, systemic malignancy. Dr. Mamo? Thanks. Yeah. So you talked about the uh, the uh, study on early diagnosis. That was what eventually led to the diagnosis. Actually, he eventually he was he presented with that, um, was worked up and had these biopsies, and that's when he was started on cyclophosphamide. He kind of just thought of it as treatment for the skin condition and didn't really think of it as an eye problem. Um, so that's kind of how he was not followed up for so long. He kind of thought it was taken care of and treated. Um, so. Yeah, it is what I read too. It's one of the more rare signs. So I thought it was interesting that he had that as well. I think so. I, I, I couldn't quite figure out or uh, I was trying to decide if maybe that led to some systemic inflammatory response that was too, I don't, I don't know if that sensitized him and led to this or if that was just kind of a, a red herring, I think. Dr. Mifflin?
from what I read, the sensitivity of, the, of that is 80, ar around 80%. So that's a good point. All right.